Father, I thank you for this day that you have given to us, a place that you give us to come and, and worship you freely, a place where you have promised to meet us in a special way. And Father, I pray this morning that as we take a look into your word, uh, that we would allow it to penetrate our hearts and our thoughts. And uh, Father, I just pray today that, uh, that you would use me, uh, that you would work through my sins, for there are many, and that in spite of myself, that you would speak because of your power. Help me to be a blessing to my friends here in this room. And help us to leave this morning knowing more that you love us, and that because you love us so much, that we can love other people. We thank you for everything that you give to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. If you want to turn in and hold in readiness, turn your Bibles or open your apps or whatever you're using this morning to the 22nd chapter of any gospel. The 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel this morning. Luke chapter 22, and that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our, our time this morning. We have been in, in a process, of course, this month, appropriately devoting our attention to the topic of love. And it's easy to see that it's a good thing and, and something that we need to do because we live in a world that is just incredibly, incredibly confused about, about that issue. And, of course, God's Word is, is the source of good teaching, uh, sound instruction. And the Bible says some really great things about love. For example, Jesus would say in the 13th chapter of John's Gospel, when he's with his apostles on that night that he's betrayed, he says, here, here I'm going to give you a new command. And this command that I give you is to love one another. And then he goes on to say after that, he says, and this is how, this is how everybody will know that you are my disciples, by the fact that you love each other. That's how it will be done. A little, uh, little bit earlier in that same discourse, Jesus had looked at his apostles and said, well, there is no greater love that a person can give to anyone than someone lay down their life for somebody else. I mean, Jesus spoke a lot about love, and he said some incredible things about, about loving and, and being loved. Others, of course, caught on to that, that same uh, thought line. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul in that 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse number 13 says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The Apostle John, likewise, in 1 John chapter 4, uh, verse 7, would say that everyone who is born, everyone who loves is born of God. It, it comes from God. And, and we love because God lives within us. In, uh, in the fourth chapter, the 19th verse again in 1 John, he says that we love because he first loved us. And if you haven't picked it up, the Bible is a love story from cover to cover. It talks to us about God's great love for humanity, the mess that mankind had made in the Garden of Eden that God cleans up with his love because he cares for us so deeply. But the Bible also says some tough things about love. In the Sermon on the Mount, which appears to happen very early in Jesus' ministry, in chapter 5, if we were to look at chapter 5 of, of Matthew in that 41st, 44th verse, he says, you've heard it said that you should love your neighbors and you hate your, should hate your enemies, but I want to tell you that you should love your enemies and you should pray for those who persecute you. Matthew 25, verse 40 Jesus gives this incredible teaching. And he says this, he says, and, and, and this, this picture comes at the end of his ministry, and he's talking about the last judgment. And he talks about people doing or not doing things for other people in a loving attitude. And Jesus finalizes that teaching by saying, whatever you did for the least of these, my brothers, you did for me. Now, there's a little discussion, I suppose, in, in theological circles about who he, ex 
who exactly he was talking about because he does use the word for the least of these my brothers and, and he's he's probably talking about the household of faith and I, I and other people think well you know what no there's a pause in there whatever he did for the least of these and then he refers to his brothers and to be real honest with you I don't know I mean there's good support for that both way but what I want do want to say is this morning we're going to set that issue aside for a while and just believe that because the Bible teaches it in every other place throughout, from cover to cover, it teaches us that we are to love all people around us. And maybe that passage, to love the least of these, just maybe it means that those that we really need to focus in on loving are those that we are the least prone to love because that's what he calls us to. Now, we get, we get the concept as Christians that, that we're supposed to love people who disagree with us. I mean, that happens all the time. It happens close to it. It happens in our families. Uh, you know, maybe your family's not like my family, but uh, newsflash is my family doesn't always agree with everything that I say. Uh, I, I don't know why. They're still in a process of learning that, uh, that, uh, that I am omniscient. Um, but, but, but we love each other in spite of those things, even though we don't see eye to eye. And, and it, it happens in, in relationships with our, our neighbors, with the people at, at work, even within the context of the church itself, is, is we get the idea that we love the people who disagree with us at times. But what about this concept of loving those who hate us? What about loving those people who really want nothing more than our destruction? How do we love those people? Now, the Bible tells a story about an incident like this, and that's where you're at. And if you turn to Luke chapter 22, and I'm just going to read a few verses here this morning, and I'm going to pick up with the 47th verse here. And Jesus is, Jesus is, this is, in, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is being arrested. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear, and he healed him. Now you may say, you know... That, that seems to be a, a, a pretty familiar story. It, it sounds like something I've heard, but it, it seems like some of the details of the story as I've heard it are missing. And that's because if you want to get the fullness of the story, you really have to glean bits and pieces of this event from all four of the Gospels. Uh, because each of the Gospel writers writes from a different perspective and emphasizes different things. They don't contradict each other. They just complement each other and talk about these things. For example, in Matthew 26, if you turn there, you would find that there is a dialogue that goes on there. And, and Jesus, there's more of the dialogue that's happening there. And Jesus even quotes the prophecy, those who, those who pick up the sword and live by the sword, those are the people who are going to die by the sword. <coughs> and that only happens in, in the 26th chapter. Of Matthew. If you were to turn to the 18th chapter of John's gospel, you would find out that the man who picked up the sword and cut the guy's ear off was Peter, and you would find that the name of the man whose ear got caught off was a man by the name of Malchus. Uh, but that's only talked about in the 18th chapter of John's gospel. In the 14th chapter of Mark's gospel, it's even interesting because he, he kind of quickly goes through that story, and then he goes on to another story where he says, and there was a young man who was standing by, and they went to grab that young man, and he ran, and he left his clothes there, and he took off evidently naked uh, because they were starting to gather the disciples, and, and that was a fulfillment of prophecy that all of them would flee. We, we use all four of the Gospels uh, to round out the story and to see what the story 
really is about. But what I want to focus in on this morning is that 51st verse in in the 22nd chapter of Luke's Gospel, when it says, Jesus answered no more of this, and he touched the man's ear, and he healed him. Now, the reason I'm here, and why I think this is significant, and to be honest with you, I don't really understand everything that's going on here, but that's, that's okay. But I do know is that Luke's Gospel is the only one of those passages that talk about the same event that tells about the healing that he touched the man's ear and he healed him. And I find that significant because that's who Jesus is. That's the lifestyle that he lived. That's what Jesus is about. He's about healing. And he's about healing even part of the group that came to arrest him and they would ultimately crucify him. Why that's, why that's important to me is I want to know that kind of love. How was he able to have that kind of love? I mean, do you do that in, in, in some kind of crowd that I'm part of and somebody gets his ear whacked off and I look at him and say, you know what, shouldn't come after me. I got guys and they got knives. But Jesus touches him and he heals him because that's who he is. That's what he is about. And I want to know, how do you love like that? How do you love like that? Now I want to give you some things that, that we can glean from this passage of Scripture this morning that I believe address that issue. How do we love in these situations? How do we love those who hate us? Because as Christians, we are called to do that. It's throughout Scripture. Jesus would even say, you know, it's easy for people to love people who like them but it's only through the power of God that you can love those who hate you. And I think that's where it begins. Is if we're really going to love like Jesus wants us to love, is that we need to know. We need to know where our power comes from. We need to know where our power comes from. Because I look at this incident and I say, I can't do that. I can't love like Jesus at that point. I'm not good at that. But I think there's, I think there's a hint here as we back up just a few, pa few verses from the passage that we're at this morning, still in Luke chapter 22, in verse 39. And it tells us that after Jesus had finished that last supper, that Passover meal with his apostles, it says Jesus went out, and I love those two words, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples followed him. Other translations say, and he went out as was his custom. Another translation says, and he went out as he normally did. And that's significant because here is Jesus facing the toughest issue that a person can ever face. Because he knows what is about to happen. He knows that he is going to be arrested. He knows that he is going to be handed eventually over to the Romans. He knows that he is going to be crucified. He knows that it's going to hurt. But he also knows there's only one place I can get my strength. He knows where his power comes from. And that was from God. You see, in our lives, we have to know. We have to know that life is primarily a spiritual battle. Do you understand that? Is that life is primarily a spiritual battle. And the real power for this battle can only come from God. And this is where the disciples failed. Because they thought, well, you know what? It's going to be our power. Shall we strike them with swords, they said? Here, here they're coming. I think we can take them, Jesus. And that's where they failed. And that's where I fail, and that's where you fail. Is because we tend to think that our power comes from ourselves. Now, I totally get what Peter was doing here. I mean, Peter had to be incredibly frustrated. 
I mean, first of all, you take the climate that he's living in, and, and they are being oppressed by the Roman government. Not only they, are they oppressed by the Roman government, but Peter has just spent the last three years going around with this man who he knows is the teacher of teachers. He knows that he is the greatest man, and the religious leaders completely reject him. I mean, this has got to frustrate him a lot. What's got to frustrate him even more is what just happened just a few minutes ago, <coughs> excuse me, in the upper room, where they clearly saw that a man by the name of Judas Iscariot was in the process of denying and betraying Jesus. And now he has seen this same Judas Iscariot lead a batch of soldiers to Jesus to arrest him. I understand what he's going through. And so he takes it on himself and he takes it out on this poor dude by the name of Malchus. Who is now looking at his ear and wondering why he came to this party. You know what's interesting in that is that they ask a quick question. What do you, but it's not even really a quest question. Shall we, shall, we take on, shall we take them on with our swords? And, and I, I don't know, because it wasn't there exactly what happened, but clearly Peter wasn't really listening. He wasn't asking Jesus what Jesus wanted him to do. He was deciding that he would take on this whole issue on his power, in his power. And he's going to take on all of these people. But he's no match. He's no physical match for these people. But still he decides to take them on. And he starts, he starts swinging away with what he's got in his pocket. Believe me, he, wasn't, he didn't just walk up to Malchus and say, Malchus, would you turn just a little bit to the right there because I'd like to slice your ear off. He was going for the whole head. Malchus ducked. Because he's going to take him on, but it's his strength and his power. And he was no match. Jesus, on the other hand, knew where his power was coming from. And Jesus knows that this is in God's hands. And that God's power will control the day. God will do what God wants to do. And if we're going to love the world like we are called to love, we have to realize that it's not going to come from our power. I can't give you, okay, here are four psychological steps that you will take so then you will be able to love each other. And you will even be able to love the people who don't love. I can't give you those. But I can say this, is that you will get the power from God himself. Know where your power comes from. Know the source. Second observation that I want to make here is, is that Jesus tells them, you need to put your sword down. Matthew 26, 52 this is the same incident, only Matthew's reading. And Matthew says, put away your sword. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. He's saying, put your sword down. Let me say it this way. When you learn to put your sword down, then you need learn to live by power rather than by strength. And let me tell you something. I believe that there is a very significant difference between power and strength. Let me, explain, let me explain to you how it works. I'm in the car with my kids. And we're driving down the road, and they're not as old and mature as they are today. They're little kids. You've all been there. You've all been in that scenario. You've got your kids in the back seat, and there's only one thing that they decide to do, and that is fight. No matter, it doesn't matter what it's over. 
doesn't matter who all's involved, they decide to have a fight. And you know what I do? I appeal to my power. And I say, I have had about enough of this. I've had about enough of this. Now, do you know how many times I turned around and beat my kids? And I see Otto, he's starting to write this down here. He's, <laughs> he's, he's going, am I going to have to report this? <laughs> he's getting ready to dial. <laughs> not once. Not once did I beat my kids. Because I appealed to my power and not my strength. Do you see the difference? Let me say it this way. Is that strength, strength comes from the inside. Strength comes from what's inside of me. Power comes from somewhere else, somewhere on the outside. It come from, can come from a variety of different places. But it doesn't come from in me. It comes from somewhere outside. That's what power is. Let me say it this way. Strength deals with the immediate problem. Strength deals with the immediate problem, but power always has a purpose to it. Or how about this? Strength is limited in what it can do, but power is unlimited. You want a conclusion to all of this? Is that when we rely on our strength, we are destined to fail. And we found the apostles in that incident relying, particularly Peter, relying on his strength. And he failed. And if we are trying to love those who hate us, if we rely on our strength, we will fail. But if we rely on God's power, we'll be successful. My point is this, is if you want to love, if you really want to love, stop fighting earthly fights in earthly ways. Stop depending on your own strength. As a matter of fact, let's do this. Finish this phrase. Fight fire with fire. Unless, unless you talk to a fireman He's generally going to say, now please don't go into it while well, you understand you sit backfires and all. I understand how that works. What I'm saying, you talk to the average fireman, you can say, how do you put out a fire? He's going to say, I use water. But what we tend to do is we tend to fight it with fire. And so what we do is we go around in our life putting out all of these small fires with a flamethrower and wondering why we're having a problem. Put your sword down. Put your sword down. You want to be able to do this, you have to do it from God's power, not your strength. Now, even when you use God's power, that doesn't mean from an earthly perspective that you are going to win every time. Because not everyone's going to respond in the way that you want them to respond, or even the way God wants them to respond. They have a choice. There is absolutely no record of Malchus ever becoming a Christian. We know that most of the priests, most of the religious people never accepted Jesus. But we know what Jesus knew is that the real war was over when he relied on God's power. And that enables us to do the third thing, maybe the most important thing, is that in this process of loving other people, we offer healing. We offer healing. Again, back to that 51st verse in Luke 22. But Jesus answered no more of this, and he touched the man's ear, and he healed him. I, I say, I'm, I'm surprised that only Luke reports this part, because it's such an incredibly huge part, in my opinion. 
Because we know, we know that all power comes from God. And we know that when we give ourselves to God's power, we will be able to overcome, to overcome our tendencies, to overcome all of the things that we would normally and naturally do. We know that that can only happen and does happen when we give it over to God. And because we know that our power comes from God, and because we have given over ourselves to his power, then we can do some pretty spectacular things. For example, we can demonstrate goodness to the world around us. And that's what we're called to do as Christians. We can demonstrate goodness because that's what loving the least of these means. It means demonstrating goodness to the people around us. I mean, look what Jesus does here in this whole episode. Judas Iscariot comes up to Jesus and Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. There is no record, there is no indication whatsoever that Jesus turns his head and says, no, Jesus, I don't want you to do this. He looks him in the eye, and he asks him a question, but he doesn't resist it. And when all of these people come to take Jesus, Jesus away, to arrest him and to haul him off, not only does he not resist himself, but he forbids the resistance of his apostles. Put your sword away. And even in this instance that we focused in on this morning, when he has the upper hand and Malchus is now sitting or standing or kneeling or lying or whatever he's doing there, and he is bleeding and quite probably has this bloody part of an ear in his hand, and Jesus has the upper hand, he heals him. He demonstrates goodness because it was the love of the Father flowing through him. Now I know that we are not God incarnate. I know we're not there. But I do know this, is that we have the Spirit of God when we come to Christ, we have the Spirit of God living within us. And the biblical promises are very clear. Is that when you come to Christ, that God gives His Spirit without measure. You don't get a little bit of the Spirit here, and then wait a little while longer, and get a little bit more of the Spirit. And you don't have to call on the Spirit to, to say, Okay, Spirit, I want you to... To, to start coming into my life now. No, when you come to Christ, the Bible says that you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. You get the whole Spirit inside of you. Do you understand that? It's, it's not a partial thing. It's not, you know what, man, I, 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 I came to Christ, got baptized, and got part of the Spirit, still waiting on the rest of it. It's not this, you got the Spirit. That's why Paul's admonition to the Galatian Christians in Galatians chapter 5, verse 25, is this. He says, since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. You see, there's this little deal called quenching the Holy Spirit. Is that while we are given the Holy Spirit in its totality, in His totality in our lives, we still have the power to quench. We can resist the Spirit's work. So the problem isn't that we need to get more of the, of the Spirit in our life. The problem is that we need to put our sword down and stop resisting the Spirit who is working in our life. And if you back up just a few more verses in this book of Galatians, you will find that the, the fruit of the Spirit is in us. It is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And all of those things are are inside of us when we have the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. So the real question is, will we do this? Will we follow the Spirit's leading in our life? Or will we say, no, what, you know what, I got this one. I'll do this one on my own strength. And it won't work. You see, that love, the fruit of the Spirit is love lives in us, and it is intended 
for even the least. Now, I don't know who the least of these will be in your life. I don't. Let me say this, though. I do know that when you meet the least of these in your life, it will not be natural for you to love them. But Jesus will love them. And you will, through the power of Jesus and the Spirit living in you, you will love them. In 1989, Time Magazine did an interview with Mother Teresa. Now, I'm not going into all of Mother Teresa's theology and all of that this morning, okay? You, you know that I have question marks about all of that. But that's not the issue here. Listen to this interview. This is with Time Magazine in 1989. Time says, what did you do this morning? Mother Teresa's response was, pray. When did you start? Half past four. And after prayer, we try to pray through our work by doing it with Jesus, for Jesus, and to Jesus. That helps us to put our whole heart and soul into doing it. The dying, the crippled, the mental, the unwanted, the unloved, they are Jesus in disguise. And she goes on. People are responding, not because of me, but because of what we're doing. Before, people were speaking much about the poor, but now more and more people are speaking to the poor. That's the great difference. The work has created this. The presence of the poor is known now, especially the poorest of the poor, the unwanted the loved, the uncared for. Why have you been so successful? Jesus made himself the bread of life to give us life. That's where we begin the day, with prayer. And we end the day with prayer. I don't think that I could do this work for even one week if I didn't have four hours of prayer every day. So time, the, the, the time interviewer looks at her and says, as humble as you are, it must be an extraordinary thing to be a vehicle of God's grace in the world. She says this, but it is his work. I think God wants to show greatness by using nothingness. Your nothingness? I'm very sure of that. You feel you have no special qualities? I don't think so. I don't claim anything of the work. It's his work. I'm like a little pencil in his hand. That's all. He does the thinking. He does the writing. The pencil has nothing to do it. The pencil has only to be allowed to be used in human terms. The success of our work should not have happened. No. That is a sign that it's his work and that he is using others as instruments. None of us could produce this. Yet see what he has done? Yet see what he has done? And Father, my prayer this morning is that you would help us to submit our hearts to you. That we would give everything that we have, everything that we are over to you. Knowing that we cannot love the least of these in our own strength and power, we cannot do it. It's not in us. But that doesn't matter because you never asked us to do it in our own strength, in our own power, but in your power. Father, I pray that my friends here this morning and I, that we would allow your power to flow through us more this day as you give it to us. Help us to be yours. In the name of Jesus, we pray.